Don't be concerned just with one part of the painting. Don't be concerned about spoiling something that you really like. Because if, if we're able to let go and maybe let a little bit of inspiration take place instead of, of control, trying to control the whole painting, then something will come in that'll say, oh, hey, look at this. This is even nicer than that was before. Well, it's like Humpty Dumpty. Can you put Humpty Dumpty together again? Ah, so okay. What we're doing is I'm trying to show people that with acrylics, because they dry so fast that you don't have to be worried about making a mistake or whatever you're thinking about. Oh, this isn't, this isn't working. That's not working. With acrylics, you can work quickly. It dries quickly. You can use a hair dryer to speed up drying. Let me stop you, you right there. Let me stop you over Ray. I don't mean to interrupt you, but... There's a difference, and I want everybody to know this, because if you're watching this and you're thinking, acrylics, wait a minute. See, what we're talking about, Oberay and I were discussing, we've got a new term we're going to start using universally. We're going to have, there's going to be acrylics, and then there's going to be fine art acrylics. You see, it used to be that acrylics, you know, everything looked shiny and plastic, and then there are guys like Oberay and women who came along and said, I'm going to make these look like oil paintings. I'm going to get the same kind of fine art quality and the same feel about it. And Oberay's work is incredible. I met him actually at um, Castle Gallery in Fort Wayne, Indiana for a show. Uh, I think it was a show of my work, wasn't it? Yeah, it was your birthday, actually. <laughs> it was. That's right. Oh, that's right. They they had this vegan birthday cake for me. <laughs> <laughs> which which was uh, made out of sawdust, <laughs> and uh, so you you came in. You drove like two or three hours or something to come in. That was very generous of you. Yeah, from Windsor, Ontario. Wow how long how far did it take you? That's that had to be four hours. It's about two hundred and fifty miles, I think. Probably it's it's about a three hour drive because I'm not a race car driver. Yeah, well, the good news is that here we are together. You're going to be on the faculty of the convention. Uh, you're, you're on here and good things happen when you show up. All right. So Oberay, uh, let's get this, um, uh, let's get this rolling. Why don't you go ahead and get your camera moved and let's go ahead and start our process of destroying a painting. All right. So here I've got two paintings on an easel. They're actually, uh, because it's a demonstration and I'm practicing and learning things every time I paint, these are on paper. Uh, there are acrylic. Uh, papers made by Hannah Mule, for instance, that are basically made for acrylic painting that work really well if you're experimenting and trying new things and stuff. So that's what we're working on today. And so I've, I've put down some stuff here, which is a kind of a basic start on acrylic painting, on these particular paintings. But I've already, because, because they were laid down quickly, just to get basic shapes in and stuff, I've already seen things in them that I want to change. And, and again, this is experimental. I'm experimenting here. I'm learning. I'm trying new things. So, for instance, this whole area here, I'm going to try doing something with greenish blues and blues in here. That's going to bring out these lighter colored parts of the cloud here. Maybe bring it more down here. So let's just do some of that and see oh, what happens when we start putting some of those kinds of colors in here. All right. Well, I think a really important lesson about this, the idea of destroying a painting, is that we we all get to the point where our paintings feel precious to us, and we feel like, oh, I, you know, I really did that tree beautifully. And then it's you realize later that it just completely is messing up your composition. So you have to go in and destroy it and change it. So this will be fun to watch. Yeah, that, that's actually an important point because the fact of the matter is I, I know myself personally get into this. There's a specific part of a painting that you think that's really a beautiful passage and you kind of want to leave it alone. But as we all know, you can't leave any one thing alone and, uh, and you can't leave one thing alone because every time you change any part of a change and you change the whole painting. So as you notice, when I'm putting this down at the same time, I'm kind of of rubbing it out. I, I use my fingers, I use brushes, I use anything I've got, I can get my hands on 
in order to paint. So, and the point Eric just made is, is really good. Don't be concerned just with one part of the painting. Don't be concerned about spoiling something that you really like. Because if, if we're able to let go and maybe let a little bit of inspiration take place instead of, of control, trying to control the whole painting, then something will come in that'll say, oh, hey, look at this. This is even nicer than that was before. So, yeah, it's over, it's, part of it is overcoming wanting to hang on to something. And the other part of it is when you're working with acrylic, knowing you have the ability to change things fairly quickly, easily, and you don't have to be afraid of making changes. You don't have to start thinking that you spoiled something and you spoiled a painting or something like that. Uh, and you can have some fun with it just because you're letting go and letting the paint and things do a little bit of the work for you instead of trying to control everything. All right. Well, oh. also, you know, you're putting a light over a dark uh, w with oil. One of the things that sometimes will happen is that over time, that dark will will uh, migrate through that light. What happens with fine art acrylic? Well, generally, what what the first thing to think about when you're working with acrylic paint is that it dries uh, at least one value darker than you see in it when you put it down. And it can dry more than one value darker if you have a color under it, for instance, that is uh, is darker. So I'm going over a darker color with a lighter color here. So what I put down here, uh, this really light color here that I put down here, you're already seeing is changing a couple values. So you have to be aware when you're putting the color down that it's going to dry a little bit darker. So uh, that's one thing to keep in mind. As far as over periods of time, acrylic paint has been proven over a period of time to be as color, uh, what, I don't know what the word is, color fast, color fast, uh, color fast as oils. And, uh, and so I wouldn't worry so much about how much change is gonna take place over time. I don't think you'll find any more than what takes place with oils and quite possibly less. I don't know if that's been proven less because proven conclusively because acrylics haven't been around for several hundred years, but they do test them. And when they test them, they test them for what would be in an environment they might be in for 150 years or so type of thing. So it's not like they, it's not, not like they don't have any idea how retain, how, how the color is retained. They do significant testing on them. So it's not something to worry about. And that's why so many more artists are starting to do fine art in, in acrylics now. Some of the best painters in the country are doing painting with acrylics uh, and painting incredible paintings. Now I'm getting questions about what kind of acrylics you're using. I, I paint 90% of the time, I think with, uh, with golden. And that's partly because when I started painting with acrylics 30 or 40 years ago, I hate to even think of how long ago it was, uh, I was, uh, I started with golden. And uh, I discovered over the years, after working with a lot of different kinds, that golden actually is a really good, a really good, a, a really good product. And they have really good technical backup information available readily, advice available read readily. So I've stuck with Golden over the years. All right. Well, we'll do a shout out to Mark Golden. Hey, Mark. Hey, team at Golden. Thank you for uh, for uh, making such great paint. Yeah, no kidding. All right. So, so uh, one of the things that I, I'm curious about with acrylic is that uh, you know, there was that period of time when acrylic dried with a, a little bit of a film and kind of had a shininess to it. How do, how do you overcome that? Well, uh, it's not unlike oils in that respect. Uh, when you're working with oils, some areas, uh, some areas are brighter and, and have more shine than others. And that's why you do oiling out when you're painting with oils to get everything at, at an even gloss, for instance. That's why you often oil out when you're painting with oils uh, before you put the varnish on to try to get an even sheen. So that happens with acrylic, acrylics to some degree as well. 
Except uh, you can't oil out. What do you do? Water out? <laughs> <laughs> when they're when they're still wet, you can water out. Once they're dry, there's actually several different kinds of varnishes that are available, just like in oil painting. So there's a there's a satin varnish, there's gloss varnish, there's matte varnish. Oh. Uh, you might have to put, depending on the size of the painting, if I'm painting a great big painting, like a three foot by four foot painting or something, uh, I often have to put on two or three coats of the varnish before I get a really even looking finish on the painting, uh, whether it be all matte or all, all uh, uh, gloss. It sometimes takes two or three coats of varnish before you do it, but it's just like oil. Okay. You finished and decided you've done all you're going to do on it. Uh, the one advantage, again, with acrylics in that respect is that you can actually uh, make the change, put the varnish on after, you know, a couple of days after your painting is done. All right. Because they dry so fast. So you don't have to wait to put a final varnish on. You don't have to wait. Six months. Six months or so, like is uh, uh, suggested in uh, oil paints. So well, Elizabeth, Mitchell ha on. El Elizabeth Mitchell has a question over Ray. Do you use a medium with your acrylics? Uh, I don't hardly, I don't hardly use mediums. Sometimes uh, I use. Uh, so there's different ways to extend the drying times of acrylics. One of them, of course, is. Golden does the golden open products now, which extends the drying time of the varnish. Uh, so you can you can use open uh, golden open instead of heavy body. Yeah, uh, I found other ways to extend the drying time. So there's a, a thing called a golden flow release, which is actually made to make the paint flow easier, spread easier on the on the surface that you're working on but i found that by putting a little in a jar like this a 10 percent mixture in this this one looks like soap is flow release and it's a surfacant like soap is a surfacant so that's why you get this but when i spray i sometimes i spray some on my palette like this and i found that that by keeping my palette a little bit wet with this it helps it to stay wet longer I also find if I'm working on a big painting and I'm covering a large area, like you know this area of a, a painting at one time, I can I can spray flow release, uh, you know 10, 10 to ninety percent mixture flow release onto the painting, and that keeps the golden acrylics working longer too. Are I occasionally that, use a soft gel and mix it in with the paints. Oberay, are you yeah. saying that it's 10% uh, golden flow release and water? 10% golden flow release to 90% water, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Good, 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 good. So that, you know, that, other than that, I use some gel medium occasionally, and that's, uh, uh, that, help, that, that helps the retention at last, the paint stay workable a little longer too. But I don't actually, too much in the way of mediums. All right. Part of it, part of it working, I found also is being brave when you're putting color down. Because, like I say, you can change it again. Uh, but if you put a little bit more color down at any given time, you, uh, how would you explain this? If you're working, if you're, if you're brave enough. To put color down fairly confidently and just say to yourself, well, let's see what happens when I do this. You'll find that you're working faster and you don't need the additives as much anyway, because you can paint over things like I said at the beginning of this. So you don't need to worry so much about additives because you can work over things, change things. This, this part of it might be, you know, working out a working out something to do a bigger painting from. So you're trying something here. You're trying to just get some patterns going. And you might say, hey, I like this or that or the other thing about this particular painting. And I think that I'll make a bigger painting of it. All right, we oh. have a question. You ready? Yep. Uh, how do you keep your palette uh, wet when you're doing plein air painting? 
and you're outdoors and it's warm. Well, almost every plain air painter uses a stay wet palette, or I think most of the ones I know who are working with acrylics outdoors. So I don't know if everybody knows what a stay wet palette is. This is, they're called Masterson. So this comes looking like this. You open it up and you've got. Can you hold it up in front of the painting? We can't see it. Oh, okay. So this has a lid that goes over it. Then under here, what you have is you put a piece of foam on the bottom of, of this, underneath this paper pallet is this foam, uh, rubber. So you have this wet, and then you have specially produced acrylic paper pallet, uh, paper pallet. So, so this is a really, really tough paper. You have to soak this for about half an hour in water. Then you put it on your sponge, and the, this absorbs water from the sponge slowly over a period of time. And that helps keeps your acrylics workable a whole lot longer. I met the so, people who, who invented that at the NAMPTA show one year. Oh, yeah. I've never met any of the people that invented this, but they sure invented a good idea. It, it's used widely now by acrylic painters in general. Uh, and it comes in, I think they come in about three different sizes. They come in like kind of small, medium, and large. So the smaller ones might be handier for plain air painting. When I'm in the studio, I often have two this size going. And in this case, I've got blue, I've got my cooler colors on one side and my warmer colors on the other. Sometimes if I'm working on a really big painting, I might have my cools on one palette and my warm colors on another palette side by side. And I'm kind of mixing cool colors on one palette, warm colors on the other. And sometimes they're getting mingled and messed up like everything does in a painting. But it gives you lots of room to, to work on a palette if you have two of these and you're working on a big painting. But hey, Nanny. Oh, oh, Beret, uh, I, I need to take a break. You want to tell us uh, what you're about to do next? Uh, I'm going to do something on the ground here. Uh, this kind of gave me an idea of what happens if I put blue on there instead of green. I might do a little more detail here. If I have time during this half hour, I may not. I was going to do some work on here, show what it would look like to uh, make this look more like a sunset, bring some warmer colors up here. Okay, I've just been messing around with some colors on the foreground here. Uh, so I'm getting some uh, orangey greens in there. Uh, as everybody knows, you're looking to harmonize the painting. I've got all these oranges and stuff up here, so I'm I'm uh, keeping some of the warm colors down here as well. Uh, but I'm getting some of those greens in there to suggest uh, grass and uh, a field as opposed to uh, whatever else it might look like. A lake? A lake, yeah. I could put a lake in there. I often do. I love painting water. So on this painting over here, for instance, I could easily put a lake in here. Again, we're just playing at this point. We're just practicing. We're just trying things out. But again, so I'm just showing you how you can change things easily and not be afraid to. So I don't even know what's going to happen to this painting in the next uh, day or two. I or as, a, or as a practice, whether it'll lead to another larger painting. Uh, I'm just kind of trying out ideas here. So I'm not, again, like we're talking about and like Eric was talking about, it's not a matter of holding on to one part of a painting and, and saying, oh, this part is so good and trying to build the whole painting around that one part. We're trying different things here and we're, we're making changes fairly quickly. You see how I'm putting color over color, putting color under color, just to see what's gonna happen with the different values and stuff like that. So I need to get some warmth in the, the tree here, reflecting the cloud and stuff like that. So you watch how this 
this warm color I'm putting on this tree here, how much darker it dries than I'm putting it on right now. You'll see in a, in a couple minutes. So it looks right, like right now I'm making it quite light compared to the way it was a couple minutes ago. But when it dries, you'll see how much darker it looks again. So the other thing that I'm looking at right here right now quickly is I would like a slower transition in the sky here and probably back here too. I might take some of this out. I might take some of that out. So to get that slower transition in the background over here, I'm going to put some oranges in there that are going to blend in to a certain degree with the clouds there, become part of that bank of clouds. Again, it's going on lighter than you think it should be because of the fact that it's going to dry darker. There's a question uh, from, let's see who it is. I can't find it now. Anyway, the question was, um, what was the question? Oh, I've lost it. The comments are moving so fast, I, I have lost it. I'm so sorry. Oh, do you do a lot of dry brush work from, that's a question from Elizabeth Gay McDonald. Oh, Elizabeth. I know. Elizabeth is a friend of mine. We paint together. She lives up here. Uh, awesome. Do I do it? Yes, I do probably. Uh, that would be on a bigger painting further along, something that I'm developing. Uh, so I might leave it for a day or two and keep looking at it and see what it needs and stuff like that. And then at some point start uh, putting some more color over top, changing colors again, like I'm doing here. I'm doing wet into wet here. But further along in the process with a more developed painting, I might decide that I want to... Uh, that I want to start changing colors again, and I, I might do that with more of a uh, dry brush technique. Good That's to more know. changing colors gradually when you're doing a dry, dry brush technique. You can change colors gradually. And a lot, of my, a lot of my big paintings, I've done that with. So in order to get a really smooth transition of color here, if you're doing a, a large painting, to do a, a real gradual transition of color, you actually have to build up layers and layers. So changing to, to get a smooth transition of color through here and having a really bright color, say, at, at the top edge where the sun is, is hitting it, say. So we put some really bright color up here. So I lay that down like that, and it's coming down here. The sun is catching it here. And it's less of it as more of it as as the as it reaches into the sky. Of course, it's getting it's getting more sun, so you're getting lighter colors up here. Now that's going to dry quite a bit darker, as I've been explaining. Than I put it than it is when I put it down right now. So I might lighten up all of this to a certain degree, and then I'll look at it in an hour. And I mean, it's fairly dry. To, acrylics, like we're talking about, dry fast. So in five or 10 minutes, this, this feels relatively dry. But the actual changes it goes through to, to the point where it's uh, dry, dry, and the, the values are changing as it dries, that, that, that takes, you know, an hour or two or three hours type of thing. So uh, I make these changes now. And I decide when I look at it an hour from now and everything is dry, that it's not as light as I thought it was. And I want to make it lighter, particularly in certain places. So pretending now it's dry, I say, well, I want that yellow more yellow. I want it brighter and I want it lighter. So now I have to go back and put more brighter, lighter yellow on there than there was when I put it on before. Again, with, when this dries again, it's going to dry a little bit darker, and I might look at it again in a few hours or a couple days. I might put it aside for a couple days, come back and look at it and think, geez, that's not nearly as bright as I thought it was, and I might have to put down another layer of color. So to get that gradual change of, of color that I'm talking about, it sometimes takes 
on big paintings where I've done like, uh, you know, four by five foot paintings and stuff in acrylic, I often put as many as 20 or 30 coats of paint on different areas in order to get the values I'm looking for, changing day by day by day. And when you change the value somewhere, you want to change it somewhere else as well. So that's where I guess the dry brushing kind of idea comes in is when you're in the in the final stages of, of doing some detail and you're changing values slightly, you're changing, you're putting detail in with a little bit more emphasis here, or there, or the other place. Uh, so that's that's where the dry brushing would come in. Just like here, this putting these other coats of that color on there or changing things, creating detail in a certain area. So I want more detail in this tree. So I go back to that. Like I say, it's dried a lot darker than it was when I put it down. So I take some more lighter color to get a little bit more detail here maybe. And I put another coat on here, which is again gonna dry darker than I'm putting it down, but at least it's starting to give a dimension to the tree, starting to create some detail so the tree doesn't just look like a flat plane. So, yeah, do you want to address how to get form? Yeah, you, to, to get form, you're looking at, at, at painting the way the light strikes something. So if I've got light coming from here, which I obviously do because I've got lighter, I've got light hitting these cloud, this cloud here. So the light is going to hit the tree from this side. So this side is going to be more light. So I paint that side lighter. I leave this part darker. Uh, I might want to get a little detail in that darker part as well. But I, in a simple painting like this, you're not looking for a lot of detail. You're looking for form. Uh, but I might want to put a little bit of green in here instead of this dark blue in here. I just have to make sure that my lightest green is on the side that's getting the most light. Again, I like I like I like the the play of the dark against light here in the cloud. So I don't want to make that make that too light. But I also so want... what do you what do you paint on normally? You're 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 painting on hand mule hand mule uh, paper right now. Yeah. Uh, are you normally paint on canvas? Yeah. When I'm doing a when I'm doing anything large and not just experimenting, I I I paint on canvas. And again, canvas. When I'm painting on hand mule paper, for instance, I often put a coat of gesso or a couple coats of gesso over it uh, to give it a little bit more bite. Uh, but it gives me uh, an option to try some things out uh, without, well, maybe keeps the cost down. And most artists, especially if you're, if you're learning, keeping the cost down is, uh, is significantly important. So working on paper provides that, provides that opportunity. Absolutely. You don't mind messing around, playing around, trying things, uh, if it's not quite as expensive as it is, yeah. if you're working should, on canvas. I should mention this is not copy paper. This is painting painting paper. There are companies that make uh, paper for painting on acrylics or oils. Um, Han Mula is one. Um, uh, let's see. I think Rembrandt um, makes them and some others. Yeah, I've... I've uh... I met I met well online uh, one of the Hanumul uh, representatives in in the United States, and she was kind enough actually to send me some paper, which I thought was really cool. So I've I've been working with it for a while now, just to test it out type of thing, and uh, I found it helpful to me at least to to have another way to to practice. And sometimes I even take this out when I'm doing plain air. They make an oil painting paper as well. Yeah. Sometimes I take it out when I'm doing plain air uh, and work on paper while I'm doing plain air again, because it's, uh, it's, it's a, it's a way you're not starting to get 
Thank you. Oh, I got to get a finished piece here while I'm doing this plain air. Right, right, right. Well, and that, that calling the rep worked out because they got a plug on this show, didn't they? <laughs> yeah, didn't they? Yeah. All right. So I'm going to ask you, because we're going to run low on time here before long, I'm going to ask you to start working on the other painting for just a minute because we want to show how you're going to destroy that and fix it. Okay. So just a few minutes while you were talking, I put some more color in here. So I love painting skies. I mean, you could have probably seen the paintings behind me. Back there, there's a lot of skies in them type of thing. But I do love painting skies. So, uh, and I love painting sunsets. So to get to get this to get something happening here, I'm bringing this warm color up further, getting redder and redder as I go up here because warm colors, as we all know, advance. So putting some warm colors. Up here, bringing the clouds forward type of thing. Again, I'm going to be changing colors up here as the painting goes along. I'm going to have darker purples up here, but I'm just, again, playing right now. I'm going to put some of this. Actually, I look at this warm red here, and I like that, and I'm going to change some of this dark purple into a warmer, warmer red, I think. Partly to drop it back a bit because I want this to come forward. So if it's a little lighter down here, it's going to move move that back a bit. Again, we're talking values at this point. The brighter the colors are, the warmer they are, the more they come forward. So working with sunsets can be a little tricky in that way because warm because sunsets in general are fairly warm. So to, to keep, keep a sunset feeling warm and still having the values right can be, can be a little bit tricky, but it's just like anything else, it's, it's a matter of practice. I'm going to move some of this around here a bit because it's too fast to transition here. Uh, I think I'm going to put some... Something in the tree here in the foreground right away just to, to get this value down. I just mentioned my, my mic was not on. I apologize. Overray Livingston is our guest today. If you just tuned in, he's painting acrylics on paper right now and showing how to take a painting, destroy it, and then fix it. All right? <laughs> so we're, we're getting we want we want to get some darks in the foreground here to start getting some perspectives perspective so again i'm just scribbling stuff in right now to get forms to get values and stuff so we were talking about putting anything we want into a painting at, at the, when, we're, when we're playing around with one here. So we talked, Eric brought up water. So for instance, in this painting, we could put some water in. All right, let's do it. Now we're the just gonna do, do something for the value here, get an idea of what value we want. Because uh, I may change this to having more, more orange in it to reflect the uh, reflect the sky more. So if we say this is about gonna, let's just try that and see what happens. We're going to. We still need to get some darker values in here yet. I think. If you wanted that tree to come way forward, you'd darken that quite a bit, wouldn't you? This one here? Yeah. Yeah. And I will before long.
If you guys are enjoying this, make sure to give a like or a thumbs up and uh, share it with your friends. Um, so you can kind of see some ideas on acrylic painting and also on how to take a painting and kind of redo it. Yvette is asking, why does it look like pastel? <laughs> you know, whether I paint in oils or whether I paint in acrylics, I have all kinds of people telling me they like my pastels. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I'm not sure why that is. I think it may be just the palette I use. Uh, it may be, or it may be the way you, you do a lot of little tiny brush strokes. It may, may kind of feel like a pastel painting. Could be. I haven't quite, I haven't quite nailed down why it is, but I have pastel painters all the time telling me how much they like my pastels. So. <laughs> <laughs> I take it all as a compliment. Believe me, if, my if anybody likes my work for any reason at all, I think that's fabulous. I think what we ought to do is we ought to sneak you on to Pastel Live <laughs> and, and see if anybody even notices. Hey, that guy's using a brush. <laughs> yeah, you sneak, sneak me on to Pastel Live and I'll show up as a, as a uh, what do you call it, a, what would, what would the word be for somebody who's pretending they're something or not? <laughs> imposter. Huh? An, an imposter. imposter. I would be, yeah, I would, I would be showing up as an imposter pretty darn quick. <clears throat> full pastel. Yeah, we could call it full pastel painting. <laughs> well, we don't want to make the pastel, our friends in pastel mad. <laughs> uh, so I'll tell you what, I have some friends that are, are part of the faculty at the plain air convention who are incredibly good pastel artists who just blew my mind. And, uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing them at the, uh, at the plain air convention, believe me. Well, I'm looking forward to, uh, actually seeing anyone in person. Pretty exciting. Yeah. Well, we were talking a little bit before about the importance of the, the importance of the plain air festival, generally speaking, in terms of the fact that with the world being the way it is nowadays with so much going on and so many people kind of finding fault with this and that and the other thing and creating contention and separation, that painters actually create something positive, creative, and constructive. You can't you can't be painting and thinking you know this guy is really that way or this guy I really don't like this guy or I don't like that or I don't like the other thing. When you're painting, you're painting, you're creating, you're giving, and to have a whole group of people together like we do coming up at the Plain Air Convention, you know, a thousand people working together to create something, to communicate together about what they're creating, talking about nothing but positive, creative, constructive things is in my in my thoughts a blessing for the planet when it's much needed that whole that whole feeling of what we're doing on this planet so i think the plain air convention is a good opportunity for people in general to come and share in something that the planet needs well thank you for that uh your camera got bumped and it's a oh, little i'm off. sorry that's right i know you have to get your camera pretty close that's why we produce professional videos. You know, a lot of people are, are teaching on Zoom and on with iPhones, and it's, it's, a, it's a great thing. But, you know, if you really want to get into the pro-level, high-definition, you know, that's why we have cameras with big lenses. Yeah, I paid, I had to pay uh, $20,000 for a lens for this one camera so we could get good close-ups. <clears throat> so it makes a big difference on those videos. Yeah, no kidding. Not, you know, from my experience, with a little bit of experience I have with just cameras to do something like this, <laughs> I know what you're up against to get a to get a good image. Okay, so doing this in the in the foreground shows you how it we're getting we're getting a point a focal point here. We're getting you know, some more, something more exciting going on, something that's actually looking like clouds coming forward and stuff again. Now, is that supposed to be water or is that supposed to be grass? It doesn't matter. At this point, this is grass and this is water back here. Yeah, so again, you know, this, this, any, any of these things can, 
can change. I'm just kind of roughing things in to get the idea of values and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is, this is again, is just practice. So I'm going to, I would end up maybe bringing the water down to here and making the, making the foreground darker. Okay. Yeah. So I just quickly brushed on some blue there. So I don't like that anymore. So again, we're talking about how we build and how we destroy things. So, yeah. and how we don't have to be afraid. So that, that blue is actually, uh, I'm not sure whether I have to bring the clouds higher yet or the uh, clouds lower, but I think I'm just going to try something here. So for instance, I just put all that blue on there. I'm going to take a wet cloth here and rub some of that off again. Oh, we're not afraid of trying to make changes with acrylics. Go a wet cloth. If you just put down some acrylic paint, actually, while I was messing around with trying to get back online there, some of that blue paint dried, but I can still take some of it off. So we're going to do that. I'm going to take... Hello? <laughs> okay. All right, you're going to throw some of that up into the sky. And I'm going to get more red up into the sky. Why more red? Because I'm just, again, I'm just looking to see what's going to happen here. Am I going to make, be able to make an interesting painting just by keeping the whole sky red and building the sunset up from the bottom? Maybe no blue sky at all. Uh, because this is just an experiment, and uh, and we're and we're learning to not be afraid of experimenting. I'm just putting some paint down here. I would, if you know, if it wasn't a time limit because of uh, broadcasting, I would do something like this. Then I would By the let way, it dry for a little that's while. Re that's really looking like it's coming forward over my head. That's very interesting. Yeah, so you know, if you if I left this alone for a little while and uh, and let it dry and then come back to it, which is what we you know what we often do if we're painting in the studio as opposed to painting outside, we let things dry a little bit and then we come back to them and try something else. Okay, I'll tell See you what. what why, don't you come back on cam why don't you come back on camera over, Ray, because we're going to have to wrap it up. And then that way people can meet you. They didn't get a chance to see you uh, if they tuned in late. And then uh, I'm sorry we have to cut you short, but uh, unfortunately, that's the way of the world. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Now, you're I wearing a, you're we I appreciate good. Now, Turn around. You're wearing a no apps hat. Tell me quickly about no apps. NOAPS is the National Oil and Acrylic Painter Society. Am I am I on camera here? Okay. Yeah, you are. There you go. It's the National Oil and Acrylic Painter Society, and uh, and it's now has about twelve or thirteen hundred members. Some of the best known artists in North America, uh, and some of the best acrylic painters actually in North America are members of the National Oil and Acrylic Painter Society. So anybody who is painting fine art acrylics uh, and wants to enter shows that are uh, highlighting some of the best of acrylic painters uh, around, check out National Oil and Acrylic Painter Society and go back and click on the previous shows and see the, the level of work that is being shown that's being done with, in acrylic painting uh, already around, around you, all around you, artists all around you. Okay. So, uh, Oberay and I were talking earlier, if you missed this, we're now going to start using the term fine art acrylics because there's a big difference in the way that you paint. So, we'll, it's it's now fine art acrylics. Uh, uh, we're going to use, we're going to get every acrylic painter to, that does fine art acrylic painting to use it. 
Hubba Ray, uh, we will put your website in the comments and people can visit him and his website. Also, uh, Hubba Ray is in Castle Gallery in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I know because that's where we met. And uh, Hubba Ray, thank you so much for being on today. We learned a lot. It was very, very helpful. It was a pleasure being on. And if anybody has questions, they can find me on Facebook and ask a question uh, on the message app there or whatever. All right. Anyway, it's been a pleasure talking with you, Eric, and I can't wait to uh, see you at the Plain Air Convention. And, and anybody who's watching today, if you're at the Plain Air Convention, come up and say hello to me. Yeah, you'll be teaching in the field, too, and giving advice. That'll be helpful. Mm -hmm.